Let's talk about open face helmets. Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scott Lego Toy. So here we're going to look at the issue of open face helmets and something I frequently encounter on the internet when looking at types of open face helmet like this Salet, which is a new acquisition of mine, 15th century, second half of the 15th century uh, from Armour Services Historical Ash. Um, and a lot of people will go, they'll go like, well, why did people use open face helmets when they could have had, you know, visors or been wearing a beaver or had a, a closed type of helmet like an armet or indeed a closed helmet or various forms of great helm or bassinet or so on and so forth. Why did people have open face helmets? And we have looked at this topic before, but it comes up time and time again. And so we're going to set a little bit of context here. And also I'm going to address the fact of the number of people that got shot in the face with arrows during the 15th century. But just super quickly before we get into the meat of this video, we're going to have a quick word from our sponsors who for this video are Raid Shadow Legends. Raised a hugely popular turn-based fantasy combat game for your PC or mobile phone. Whether you like fighting in the dungeons or fighting person versus person arena battles, Raid's got tons for you with over 600 champions and here are some of my favourites. So I'm a big fan of Battle Sage, not only does she look amazing but I absolutely love her double-ended Naginata glaive thing. She's basically designed to kill the spider of the spider's den. Also a big fan of Menea from the Banner Lords. She's got a cool rapier and dagger combo. She's all about healing and keeping your team alive. I also love Astralon. Not only can he attack one enemy twice, but if you pair him with Countess Lix, then they act as a duo and she attacks with him. Now's a fantastic time to get started in Raid. And if you click the link in my description below or scan my QR code here on the screen, you'll get a free starter pack worth almost $30. We're talking about a free epic champion called Teyra 200k silver, 1 energy refill and 1 XP boost and 1 ancient shard so that you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get into game. All this treasure will be waiting for you up here in the inbox and remember this is only for new players and only for the next 30 days. So back to the main topic of this video, open face helmets. So whenever I show open face helmets like this, let's take this one off, okay, and we'll talk more about this particular design of helmet in future videos. It is a salad but it has no visor. It can be worn with a bever, it can be worn with a male coif, it can be just be worn with a, uh, a throat, a gorget, a, or a form of um, standard, as it's called, so a male uh, neck defence, or basically nothing at all. Okay, we find all options in medieval art, and we know that <laughs> happened. Um, but we're also going to look fleetingly at other types of helmets from other periods, all the way back to, well, the Roman era and beyond, basically, that don't have visors on them. So for me, the issue is this. Often when we're talking about past historical periods and we talk about face injuries, stabbing to the face with spears and swords and things like that, or indeed being shot in the face with arrows or crossbow bolts or slingshots or whatever, um, people of the internet often talk about the fact that it's really stupid to have an open face. Well, first of all, people don't really complain about the fact that a Norman or a Viking or a Frank or an Anglo-Saxon has an open face. I think because people assume it's a degree of evolution. A lot of people assume that we went from open face helmets, and if we go back to the um, Roman helmet here, um, that we went from open face helmets that maybe had cheek pieces on them or maybe had a nasal, and that somehow through evolution and becoming more advanced as humans, we developed face protection and face protection was a good thing and was something that was more advanced and more desirable in all situations. And this is a fundamentally wrong assumption. The first thing to state is that helmets with full face protection existed in antiquity. Okay, if we go back to um, the time of the, uh, Greece or the time of the Romans, I mean, famously, Roman cavalry helmets often have a full face protector on them. And to some extent, this probably forms the basis of things like the Sutton Hoo helmet um, or various types of Vendel helmet, which have also full face protection. So helmets with full facial protection existed all the way back in antiquity and still existed um, in early medieval Europe. And, let, and yet people, I think, overlook that and don't complain about the fact that when we get to the Viking era, helmets pretty much look like this for most people and they don't have full face protection. So if a Viking warrior or an Anglo-Saxon gets shot in the face with an arrow, no one makes any remark. However, if we now fast forward to later historical periods, for example, the Hundred Years' War, the Wars of the Roses, the Hussite Wars, um, the, the, essentially the 14th and 15th centuries, and we get into the era when visors, at least for knights, are more common, or facial, facial protection is more common. So 
Obviously in the 12th, 13th, 14th century, particularly 13th and 14th century, we've got forms of great helm, which are fully encasing helmets, which protect the face, the side of the um, neck and the back of the head as well as well as obviously the top, which pretty much all helmets do. And they protect the entire head like sticking a bucket on your head, okay? So people think of that as ultimate head protection and face protection and would make you impervious against lots of attacks, yes. But bear in mind that lots of great helms had another helmet underneath, or at the very least, a male coif, a male and padding coif, padded coif. So very often in medieval art, we see the great helm taken off and you know, after a certain point in the combat or within certain situations, they decide it's better to fight with the Great Helm taken off for better visibility, breathing, uh, hearing, speech, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and we just see them fighting in either the Cervelier or the bassinet later on, or the male coif. So clearly they saw that as a fair trade-off. There were certain situations where it was better to remove your great helm. Now, when we get visors that come along, so helmets that have a liftable and easily removable and easily replaceable face protection, I think people assume that in that period an open face helmet is stupid. And equally, as we um, saw on the Facebook page recently when we're looking at battles from the Wars of the Roses, often when people get shot in the face with an arrow, and we know that a visor might have been present or a beva might have been present. People go, oh, that person was so stupid for opening up their visor or taking their beva off. But we have to understand that that was actually quite a normal situation. So your average 15th century soldier, even if they have a visor, probably doesn't have the visor down most of the time because of the inherent disadvantages of doing that. Now, I think where there's a disparity here is a lot of people, when we're talking about medieval helmets, think about a uh, HMB um, Battle of the Nations type scenario where two groups of people are heavily smashing each other all over the bodies and head with weapons. And in that situation, in a tournament situation, absolutely it makes sense to have face protection, yeah? Especially if, unlike in Battle of the Nations, if thrusting's allowed as well. So if people are doing things like stabbing with spears or the points of swords, or indeed shooting arrows at you, yes, it would make sense to have a visor. However, despite that, we know that on medieval battlefields in the period of the Salet, huge numbers of people did not keep their visors down, even if they had a visor. Moreover, if we look at um, numerous effigies and brasses of knights from the 15th century, in an age when there were various forms of helmet which had visor, very often they wear a visorless helmet. If we look at Filippo Vardi's treaties, for example, open face helmets. If we look at various um, Palo or Cello uh, paint, uh, painting, for example, we see that numerous infantrymen have open face helmets. Even if we look at knightly effigies where every bit of their body is covered in plate, they still have exposed faces and this helmet and others like it have sometimes featured on knightly effigies where they have no sign of a visor, no attachment points for a visor, and they've got an open face. Even earlier on in the sort of Agincourt period, we see knightly effigies and brasses where they have an exposed open face with a great bassinet. This is one of the most protective helmets you can possibly get. Massively protective for the whole head, the whole neck. The weight of the helmet rests on the neck, so even when you're being hit with things like pole axes and stuff, it's not going to uh, jar your neck because your, your head's contained and supported by the structure of the helmet. So even in situations where people are wearing a great bassinet, sometimes, particularly English men at arms, decided to have an open face. So why? Why did knights who were wearing head to foot armor, in this, in this case, in terms of the 15th century, pretty much plate armor with mail, even male skirts and male um, uh, brayettes, which are like male underpants, they protected every bit of their body, and yet they have their faces exposed, either because they've lifted their visor, or they don't even have a visor, and they just have an exposed face. Why? Well, I've dealt with this topic before, particularly when we look at Batman's helmet, okay? Um, and the fact is that there are certain situations where having an exposed face has huge inherent advantages. Moreover, I suspect that most people who watch this channel haven't actually tried to do anything, like fighting or marching or being part of a group of people who are trying to achieve a goal, like take a position, with visors on, looking through a little slit. It is hugely 
um, depriving of your senses and the amount of information you can take in. And this hugely affects your survivability and effectiveness on the battlefield. So yes indeed, there is a very good reason why in the 15th century numerous famous people got shot in the face with arrows. Because the rest of their bodies were so well protected that the only bit of their body which really could be easily wounded by an arrow was the face. Okay, And that's one of the reasons why longbows were still so effective right the way through the 15th century and into the 16th century. Because if you shower or hammer enough arrows into an opposing force, flat shooting at very close range, some of those arrows are gonna find a place to stick, no matter how well armored your opponents are. Yes, indeed, you would increase your chances of survival by putting a, a visor down or holding a pavis or whatever in front of your face. But these all come at a cost, and when people are trying to coordinate and move as a uh, body of people and achieve a goal, very often it will be more effective to have um, an open face and purely cover your face with your arms or however you, however you possibly can do. If you've, Obviously, if you've got a shield, that's great, but a lot of people are using two-handed weapons, so you don't necessarily have a shield. If you're able to uh, you know, just shelter or cover your face or even turn your face away as you advance into those arrows, this may be enough, especially with this type of helmet that's pointed and presents a glancing surface. It's very unlikely an arrow is going to go through uh, this type of steel of this type of shape. Okay, So there are all sorts of ways of protecting your face temporarily. And you have to remember that visors lift up and down for a very good reason. Because you want to lift them up and put them down. Okay, If they were meant to be down all the time, they'd be fixed down. And the other thing is that many visors on historical helmets don't even lock down. They need to be, because you're wearing gauntlets, they need to be easily lift, lift up and put downable. You don't want to be fumbling around with a catch as found, is found on most modern recreational tournament fighting helmets, where for safety reasons they have a locking catch, but most historical helmets don't have a locking catch. Okay, certainly until we get to the 16th century. So, open face helmets from any era make a vast amount of sense. And yes, your face is exposed, but the trade-off is that you're able to breathe, you're able to see, there are, you're able to coordinate with the people you're supposed to be fighting with, uh, you're able to look up, you're able to look down. Visors have a hugely limiting effect particularly on vision, but also on breathing and sound and obviously your ability to communicate or give orders as well. So the fact is that from the ancient era right the way through the Middle Ages and to the modern day, the predominant type of helmet worn in war, both by common infantry and even worn by knights, by the most heavily armoured people as well, have been open-faced helmets. And even when there is a visor, like on a sallet or a bassinet, if we look at medieval art, very, very often in combat, even in combat, not just marching around, but in combat, the visors are lifted. Okay, so even if you've got a visor, it is often to those people preferable to lift that visor. I hope this has helped clarify the uh, situation slightly. The fact is that open face helmets as we go into uh, the 16th century with things like um, morions and cabosets and bergenets, they have open faces as well. Okay, some, some types of bergenet have closed face, but um, loads of types of helmets with open face were used right the way through the Middle Ages, from, uh, from the Roman era all the way through the early medieval period, most fit helmets were open-faced. As we go into, even into the age of the Great Helm, uh, particularly in the 12th and 13th centuries, more of the 13th century really, um, with face protection, they were often taken off and the bassinet grew out of the Cervelier that was worn underneath the Great Bassinet. So very often the Great Bassinet was worn in a particular situation, cavalry charge type situation or advancing into arrows maybe, and then pulled off in close combat. And then in the 15th century, 14th and 15th century, we see liftable visors, very often the visors being taken off or lifted up in close combat. And even in the, you know, the height of things like the Wars of the Roses, there are numerous accounts of the most well-equipped, heavily armoured people being shot in the face with arrows because they either had their visor up or they had an open-faced helmet. So don't always think about knights or people wearing armor as being impervious. You can never be impervious to all weapons, okay? Even tanks in the modern world, if you've got an end law, as we found out. But um, in historical periods, the fact is that you're never impervious and it's always a compromise. It's always a trade-off. And very often, 
the historical evidence is that very often people preferred open-faced helmets to visors down or closed-faced helmets. I hope this has been thought-provoking and I hope I'll see you back on the channel again soon. Cheers, folks.